until 5.30, we're going to discuss on one side more the practical implementation, what works, what doesn't work. And on the other side, we're also going to talk about the policies. So what will be the next step in the policies? And my name is Ruben Maas. I will be moderating this, this last session for today. Um, and if you still have your phone on, you can switch it on the silent mode, but please, please leave it on because we still use Slido as well. And we still have some questions, of course, after the presentation we just had. Um, but I'm also more of the, the analog version, so I will explain a little bit more about this. But a very important message, message just came in. And uh, Krista says, thank you. <laughs> because she received the message. And I don't know if she has a video message back, but she just told us she received the message. And thank you very much for your very warm support. Thank you very much. <laughs> and there were a lot of people coming, uh, coming to me during the pause asking, okay, but Mrs. O'Brien was asking everyone about what's the importance of being a little bit older and what's the pros and cons of aging. And then I asked her, so what are the pros and cons? But she didn't ask me yet, so I will ask her now. I told you I would come to you, so, so what do you think are the pros and cons of aging? Um, I think the best thing about aging is getting more confidence. Yeah, and the worst thing about aging is wanting to go to bed earlier. <laughs> There's something, but also waking up earlier? Or? No. No. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have the possibility of Slido, but I also want to ask you, because it is a working conference, we do need your, your brains as well. Um, so and if we talk about the promoting of sustainable work and healthy aging, um, we have to talk about the problems and the opportunities. So I thought this part of the room is all talking about the problem. This part is talking about this, the, the opportunities. And I give you two minutes to talk to your neighbor, and he or she is sitting next to you, just to make sure. So you, what could be an opportunity we really need to take? So this is the opportunity part, and this is the real problem part. So the problems of implementing, promoting um, this sustainable policy. So um, you may chat to your neighbor for, let's say, two minutes. Your neighbor is still sitting next to you. Let's start with the problem side. Um, I see you two chatting quite a lot with each other. Hello, hi. So, what is the main problem for, for implementing? May I ask you? May I ask you to stand up for a moment? Yeah. So, who are you? You're an old man, but we have time enough for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But may I ask you who you are? Um, I'm Ed Brenner from Switzerland, Focal Point. So if we talk about problems in, in this discussion, what's the main problem? It's that employers always have, the imp or quite often have the impre imp impression that any regulation is bad for them ah. and it gives, gives more administrative uh, burdens. And sometimes it could even mo be more clear, but it would, that would mean it's less work, but they still have the impression it's more administrative burden. And they have the impression, so it's not really true. They're a little bit afraid of, of these sort of policies because they think we have a lot of burden then. Of course, yeah. Exactly. 
Great. Well, thank you. We're going to check later on. Yeah. Um, some other problems on this side. Hello. You're all watching their telephone or asking questions through Slido. <laughs> they ask you, sir. So, uh, what's the problem when we talk about implementation? Well, when the Deputy Secretary spoke before, he said that in Spain there have been many regulations so that elderly people or older people can carry on working, but he didn't mention anything about any regulations that have made it possible for these people to be present in the labor market, the job market, but in a good condition, because there's no regulation that forces you to do that. Opportunities on this side? Who's, who's to someone, next to someone who says, I really have an opportunity? He or she, you can point at him or her. Saying, okay, yeah, an opportunity. May I ask you to stand up for a moment? Okay, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I think there's a big opportunity here. Uh, I come from Greece, first of all, so uh, you know what Aristotle said, the purpose of life is to uh, be happy. So we have a great opportunity of creating happiness at work here among workers that maybe are not that happy because of all these problems described. Oh, thank you. And who doesn't want to be happy? So if you approach it that way, yeah. So, then we can also talk with the employers later on. Okay. Over here, an opportunity. May, may I ask you? Okay. My, My name is Steve Baeza. I work for the European Agency. Um, I think it's an opportunity <coughs> that you can become a role model when you grow older. You can be a model for others with all your experience. So you can uh, show what you've learned in the past to the others. So, so that's something we can really use also for the promotion. promotion. Saying, okay, you can really use the experience and knowledge of other workers. Yeah, great, okay. These sort of questions we're going to try to answer in the next um, one hour, one hour and a quarter. Um, and we have a panel that is split in, in two. So the first panel will give some illustrations of successful implementation or approach. And the second panel will be more about the, the policies. Um, so I would like to ask to the front, uh, Mr. Santos, may I ask you to come to the front first? And you always get an applause when you come to the front, Mr. Santos. You're medical coordinator for Spain and Portugal at the P PSA group. Yes, that is not the prostatic specific antigen. No? <laughs> the PSA group is a car a manufacturer. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, what sort of cars? What? What sort of cars? Which brands? The, the, uh, we have five brands right now. Yeah. Uh, Peugeot, Citroën, DS, Opel and Bosco. Mm -hmm. That is the new uh, opportunity. For them. Okay. Um, first, because you're going to introduce a little bit more what you are doing at, at, at your company. Um, was there something that was said until now that made you nervous or um, said, hey, that's interesting, that's something we can maybe use also in our own company? Uh, I don't know right now. I, I'm blocked. You know? yeah. I, I, I learn my own presentation and I have anything, anything else to do. No problem. Yeah. It sounds like a healthy workplace, this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really have a problem with the language. So I, I speak bad English, excuse me, bad English. I, I'm, I'm sorry for the translators because uh, they, they're going to be uh, really, really bad with me. It's going very well. And I, I can see them sitting over there and they, they still look happy, so it's going well. But let's take a look, because you had something in the presentation, uh, especially also about the, the PSA group itself. So, um, switch over here. Um, maybe you can, because we don't have the remote. Or <laughs> the searching for the remote. Oh, there it is. Thank you. And it was the right thumb, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the moment you move like this, they push the main button. <laughs> okay, as, uh, as I said before, uh, it's okay, everybody? 
Yeah? Okay, raise your hands if you uh, are hearing me. Okay, thank you. Okay, PSA group, uh, five brands I told, but I I'm working in the Iberian region. In the Iberian region, we have Spain and Portugal, four factories, Madrid, Vigo, Zaragoza, and Mangualde. We, we construct almost 900,000 vehicles, and we are working more than 15,000 uh, people there. It's a great company. So, uh, we, we have two pillars, quickly. Two pillars to manage the, uh, the, the workers, the, the workers force in the company. Two pillars that is the SMST and the EBR. SMST is the safety management for health, and the EBR is a, a exemplarity, vigilance, and reactivity. Just in a few words, the SMST is constructed under people that through uh, operational and formative dynamics, they compromise to identify and eliminate, eliminate uh, uncertain behaviors with only an engagement, a common engagement of uh, safety and health. Um, talking about the employability, that I, I think it's the main or the goal of this, uh, uh, this Congress, uh, it always begins with safety policy. That is the origin of all the SMSP. Safety policy that is accepted and signed by the CEO of the, of the organization of all the comments. Sensibilization, communication, you, you see all the steps to find the management and the priority. A few words about ALT, that is work-related alert. It's a dynamic that we implemented in PSA group all over the world, and it, uh, it's really function. It's a, it's a specific dynamic that takes in account, uh, well, excuse me, there are two kinds of ALT. Number one, we feel when uh, there is a discomfort of the worker, the, the worker talks with the manager and they open the ALT number one to, uh, uh, yes, to try to fix the problem. And the ALT number two is when a physical trouble comes. Just to avoid the musculoskeletal disorder and the professional illnesses. Um, and then the dynamics of the employability, as you know, well, I think it's everybody knows this part because it's ergonomic part. Uh, we have person with the with the physical limitation, physical and mental limitation, and the job with the evaluation and the difficulties. It comes together through a 2D adaptation and work and person. And the second pillar is the exemplariness, vigilance, reactivity, VR. Just a few examples of these exemplariness. Everybody goes with the safety uh, corridor in the factory. This is exemplariness. Uh, vigilance, we have two methods. Uh, uh, it's called a uh, stop observation for uh, safety behavior. That is a tour, a monthly tool that the managers does or make, excuse me. And the second one is the uh, ground tour. They talk about, it talks about the safety conditions of the, of the factory, like uh, 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 clean uh, order and so on. It's a weekly tool made by managers. And, uh, well, the reactivity is the, uh, maybe the ALT that I told you uh, before, with a compromise, a commitment with the managers to fix, uh, to, to implement uh, measures, palliative measures in one day and definitive uh, measures in a month. And I think it's, Yes, it's all. Well, results. Yeah, results. Sorry. 
this is the more important thing in my company. Yeah? Well, as you see, uh, it's just an example of what we are looking for. In the zero accidents is not an utopy, it's a reality. It's, this is the graphic of uh, Madrid, the factory of Madrid. And we, uh, we get zero accidents two years, so it is possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll take this one. Can I ask you to take a seat? Please take a seat. And, 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 and your example is also mentioned, of course, in the brochure I had it over here. It's, it's wonderful. And the results achieved, the PSA group put respect for workers at the heart of this approach. It's one of the things, and talking about a happy workplace. Management was fully committed and workers' representatives were involved from the start. Individuals with restricted abilities were offered personalized solutions that took into account their physical and psychosocial characteristics. These are all uh, results of, of your problem. Yeah. We'll talk about this later on. Um, I would like to ask to give the floor to um, Mr. Husberg, Minister of Advisor, Department of Occupational Safety and Health, and Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in Finland. And as well, for you, was there any remark until now that you thought, hey, that's interesting, that's directly linked to what we're doing in Finland, or this is something I'm missing? Well, uh, Professor Maria Albe destroyed my presentation. <laughs> because he was saying exactly what you were saying, or it was the exact opposite? She was saying that the averages are not good enough, it's the differences that count, and that we need to think account of. You have also some slides you would like to show, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Let's take a look at those slides and then afterwards we discuss a little bit further. Okay. Okay. Let's see if my thumb is working. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oops, there it is. Okay. So. The background in Finland that we had 20,000 persons going into pension, but most of them on partial disability pension. 10,000 of people of working age are dying annually. On fatal accidents we are going down quite well. But the welfare system requires that we should have uh, 30 to 40 years of work careers to be able to cover what we want to have. And in reality, the pension age is 60 years and disability pension is around 52 years. We are working well with the fatal accidents. It's not a problem. But then when we look at uh, what does uh, it mean if we can go down on accidents down to zero, I admire what you're doing there and I support that very much. But when I look at it and our ministry is looking at it, uh, this only has an impact of one and a half months on work careers. If we are able to uh, halve the early pensions related to mental health, we can add half a year. Early pensions related to musculoskeletal disease is 0 0.3 years. Just small numbers. Uh, and if a worker loses his or her health, well, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, so therefore, uh, we had our last uh, program on uh, aging workers finishing in 2002. And we thought that, yes, it's necessary to have it because we need to talk about how to ensure good working conditions for aging people like me, and also to uh, get rid of age discrimination. Uh, we thought that the average girls are going well, but then uh, Maria came and said that look, it's not the average, it's the differences that counts. So we need to look at the people who have a low education and a heavy work, what can we do about them? Uh, we had otherwise planned that we would talk about uh, sustainable Finland in 2020 and extend work careers with three years. Now, our previous minister said that to extend the working career, we have to look at the young people to keep them at work. 
we have to look at the young couples to enable them to continue working. And the Commission has already said that uh, ensuring that uh, men and women both take care of, of the children is one way of also uh, supporting gender equality. And then, of course, we need to look at the aging workers. That is what we thought, that the aging workers is already a bit in, in order, but obviously not. Uh, we are improving, we have increasing our retirement age, but we were talking about three years. If we compare to 2010, we are not doing well enough. And I think one of the problems is what Maria is saying, that we need to look at the differences, not only on the average. Thank you very much. Thank you. And what do you expect when you're going to look at the uh, differences? Because that's, of course, what was mentioned uh, earlier on, saying, okay, you really have to look at the differences and educational differences. Do you expect the same results that were mentioned by Mrs. Oppen? Well, I doubt that there will be big differences between Finland and Sweden. Uh, the problem, of course, is how can we, on the occupational safety and health side, start looking at education? How to ensure that uh, all the workers are competent, that they are able to find work? And the major problem which we can look at is how can we deal with the young people that are going on disability pensions <laughs> below 30 years? Because there is a lot of improvement to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the last panelist for this round is uh, Mr. Sander van Leeuwen. We ask him to come to the front. We ask for you a warm applause for Mr. Sander van Leeuwen. Program Manager Sustainable Employability in the Netherlands Ministry of Social Affairs. Um, what is at this moment the, 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 the vision of the, the Dutch government towards this, this topic? Um, well, of course we, we talk about OSH, but also as a program leader we talk about more about sustainable employability. Yeah. And we try to put the topic on the agenda of people, mm -hmm. so we think without the awareness and uh, the knowledge of people about the problem, also for themselves, they won't act, so you can have all the, the measures you have at, uh, as a government or as a company, uh, but without the awareness uh, within the employers, you won't get any results. Yeah. But also, as a remark at the back, was that um, talking about problems, sometimes the impression is that it leads to a lot of maybe administrative burden, that there's a lot of problems when you really try to get to sustainable employability. Yes, but uh, that's a discussion we have also with the employers. Um, uh, but I think without uh, uh, setting the uh, problems on the agenda or raising awareness, you have to do that with, with problems. Otherwise, uh, there's no headline with, uh, with good things, there's headlines with problems. So when you want to raise awareness, I think it's for, for a couple of years, it's pretty reasonable to uh, talk about the problems and then talk about solutions. You have different campaigns, isn't it? Yeah. Can, you, can you tell a little bit more about these campaigns? Uh, yes, we started six years ago with a program on uh, sustainable employability. We had uh, the topic, uh, the broad topic uh, for employers. After, after a year we started with uh, uh, employees. But then in 2014 we started with, uh, together with the Dutch Focal Point, we started a campaign on work-related stress. Mm -hmm. um, that's run for four years. I think that's a pretty good example of how uh, we try to raise awareness and also try to activate and stimulate uh, both employees and employees. Last week, it was the week of work-related stress, wasn't it? Yeah, you noticed? Yeah, I noticed, yeah. yeah. yeah well, that's a good... Uh, that's a, I felt really relaxed last week. Yeah. No, good thing, yeah. It, it, was a, it was a week of work-related stress. We do that for the, four, the fourth year now. Um, and we try to, to make one week with, with lots of attention. We, uh, we try to um, put the minister in place to, to, have, to talk about this. Also, we have some ambassadors to talk about the problem and also, uh, which I think is really important, we try to get the numbers we know from the th scientific research out into the newspaper so we have uh, raise awareness. And uh, our experience is that uh, journalists are very willing to, uh, to uh, go with our information so that, that our point of view or our topics end up in broad media. And do you also know a little bit more about the impact? Because, of course, if you're in the newspaper, it doesn't mean you have impact. 
No, well, of course, it's very uh, difficult to measure the, the impact on the um, uh, on the workplace because, well, you can you can measure absenteeism or something, but still, um, it's questionable how much your campaign uh, adds to that. Uh, but we, I have an example. We noticed that four years ago we tried to get some ambassadors for our campaign, but nobody really wants to talk about. It. We 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 tried to to have some famous Dutch people talk about their uh, work-related stress, but everybody said, well, that's something in the past, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but because they don't have work-related stress anymore, or it's, it's not done to talk about it? They were ashamed. Okay. Uh, but now you, well, it's uh, more or less, you can't open the newspaper and somebody has a, has a, a work-related stress or has, has an illness due to work. So it, it, uh, it's become more and more acceptable to talk about it, and we hope that leads to more measures. But then you have the impression that it's getting worse. Because more people are talking about it, then you think it's getting worse. But in, at the same time you're saying, no, it was already worse then, but now we know it. Yeah, we see this, the, the number of people that are ill due to work or to work related stress is somewhat stable, but it's, it's that they're talking, about, uh, they're talking about now. So hopefully it ends up in measures of people uh, uh, well raising awareness and they will act on it. Yeah, so there's more openness. Yes? I think so. May I ask you to take a seat as well? Um, Mr. Santos, because in, in, in your company, you can take a microphone if you like, it's, it's, um, there's also this direct involvement of the employees, isn't it? Th this question about openness, this is also a question for you, that because it means that some employees really need to say, I'm stressed, I do have problems, or I'm becoming old, I, I need some help. Yeah. Um, um. I think the important thing is uh, to to get an accord with the uh, uh, social uh, partners in the company. Uh, besides, the stress and motivation is evaluated continuously in the enterprise. So you have to take plans, action plans, uh, whatever the situation is uh, getting worse or, or not. So uh, the involvement of the employees in the decision of the companies are made by uh, or through the social partners. Of so, okay, so the social partners are so, so are sort involved, of right involved in this way? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, as you were mentioning also with your earlier campaign, it, it, th this sort of discussion also needs some facts, of course. Knowing what you're talking about, knowing the research, knowing... Um, do you think we know enough about this? Are the facts already there? We never know enough. And okay. the question is that there is so much information available. So how can we collect the correct information to be able to make a policy and uh, actions? Yeah. Okay, so you need to try to get new information all the time. Um, but maybe also more qualitative information by just talking to people, talking to employees and so on. Do you have some experience with that as well? Trying to so not on quantitative level, but on qualitative level, that you really try to understand why people are feeling stressed, why they're feeling not uh, understand anymore. Well, we have uh, about uh, 350 labor inspectors that are working out on the enterprises. Yeah. And of course they talk about uh, stress, psychosocial issues and all these things. And through that we, the, or the system in Finland, is talking with people and uh, also learning about practical <coughs> examples. The question is how to transfer a good example from our one enterprise to another one. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we are using best practices and we are very pleased with having them. Yeah. About this knowledge, um, of course you are our, our expert panel, so I have a question for you. What's the proportion of pensioners, 50 to 69 years, who indicated own health or disability as the main reason to quit working? A, 21%, B, 10%, C, 5%. I'll go for the high percent. So you say 21. What do you say? I can agree. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> These are real experts. May I ask you, you can use Slido. Please open up your, your phone. And this question is also in the poll, in Slido. So what do you think? So what's the proportion of pensioners who indicated own health or disability as the main reason to quit working. This is also a test of the, the 
how much you accept the experts as an expert. Okay, 31, we have to go up to 140, I saw at the beginning, so we had just a wait now. 10% is running up. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's check. So one person, I think, is saying 5%. Who's that? <laughs> if you're sitting next to someone, you can look at his or her screen, saying 5%. Who? No, he is telling this, of course. No. But this, this of course, it, it, it is 21%. What does this mean for, for a company, knowing this? A, a big problem, because uh, you have to uh, take into account the physical limitation of the aging worker. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in, in, in my case, a, a company, a car manufacturing, 80% of the jobs or the tasks are repetitive and cycle and, uh, and requires a physical effort so it's it's quite difficult to adapt yeah but, uh, so you think okay it's logical that uh, aging people or yeah. older people don't want to work at the, at the factory in this case yeah. okay. That's right. what, what does this mean for your policy knowing that so many people say okay but this is the reason i quit well at the same time it's sometimes Sure, we need those people, but as mentioned about before, their knowledge, their, their experience. Well, what I'd like to say is that this uh, maybe, uh, it seems like we should say, oh well, it's, it's the elder pro uh, people that are the problem or that are quitting, but this implements also that it's uh, because it's their health and disability that doesn't result from a few years working in a certain condition, but it's from their youth on. So we should, uh, when we're talking about OSH or about sustainable work, sustainable employability, we should try to focus on all ages to prevent this from happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let's try another one. Um, uh, question number three. I, I'm going to ask you immediately. So, uh, what's the employment rate of people aged 55, 64 in the EU? And if you would like to discuss the outcome, it's from Eurostat. Um, let's see. Yeah, there it is. So if you say 61%, you put, push A, 54%, B, 45%, ah, there. Oh, there it goes, ah, that's interesting. Ah. What do you think? The employment rate of people aged 55, 64. I have to check what is the opinion of the majority first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As an expert, you are totally autonomous. Yeah. Of course. Uh, the, the problem that, uh, that we also have is not that the facts are not always governing the situation, okay. but it's also the mentality in the country or in a sector that has an impact on what people want to do. Let's say we take the stress example. Yeah. Uh, if the mentality in the country is that we need to get the old people away from work to give place for younger people, mm -hmm. then of course the elderly are not uh, motivated to continue. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have so much to do with age. The other thing is that uh, even if our social partners are supporting uh, aging people to work, saying that they have experience and this and that. When we go to the individual employers and enterprises, it doesn't necessarily count. This was an other answer, of course, in the question. The answer was 50, 54%, it doesn't matter. Because but what you're saying is exactly, of course, when you talk about individual, um, for example, small, medium enterprises, for them it's another discussion. So on one side, they feel maybe the necessity, and on the other side, they don't see the opportunity and the possibilities to really act at this point. It's exactly the same issue that Professor Albin was saying, that it's not enough to look at the average. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the differences. Yeah. So if I stand with one foot in, in the fridge and the other foot on the stone, an average, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yeah. 
do you do also some qualitative research within your company? What? Qualitative. So, um, not only finding the average, but really finding out why someone quits working. Why is it really the fact that it is uh, too heavy, or it is uh, they don't understand maybe anymore, or they think they are uh, not fitting the job anymore? Is there really these sort of insights interviews as well? Yes, it's a, it's a continuous interview because we have a weekly a meeting about adaptation. So, um, uh, each individual uh, talks with uh, his or her manager and we try to fix the correct uh, uh, task for everyone. For everyone. Uh, I mean, not 100% uh, it's impossible because uh, we don't have uh, so uh, light tasks. But uh, at least we try it with the meeting of ergonomics, medical services, human resources, and the managers. Well, I think that you talk about quantitative research, but uh, we did a lot of uh, campaigns on different topics like education, uh, work-related stress, sustainable employability, and actually the answer is always the same. What we hear from uh, employers and employees is that it's about engagement and involvement with one each other and talking to one each other, and after that the right message will come. So when we don't talk to each other, uh, well, you, can't, you have to talk with one each other like uh, uh, the and then we, uh, before you can take measures. Okay. If, if someone in the audience now is thinking about, I would like to start a campaign, um, and I would like, and I would ask you, what would be your advice? So if you start a campaign on this, and you really want to be successful in promoting, what would be your advice? Um, well, I think you have to, well, it depends on what your, your goal is, if you want to raise awareness or you want to activate or stimulate people. But I think it's important to, uh, to raise awareness and then to help with the right measures. Uh, but also maybe uh, it's nice to, to know we use very much, we use uh, social media. So we had a big uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook uh, website and we really invest in talking to people over there because, as I said, it's about involvement and talking to people, so we try to uh, practice what you preach on Facebook. And also, uh, for example, last week we had a, a WhatsApp service, so people could uh, um, could uh, send us a message, and then they get a, a three week, a th a three daily, three messages on how to reduce stress. So I think social media is a very nice way to uh, communicate communicate directly with people. Mr. Yeah. Uh, if I ask you, if you should give an advice on how you, as a, as, a, as a government, try to influence this discussion? What's the best way to, to, to do this? Well, that is, that is the thing that we are working with every, every time when we look at how to use the resources of the labor inspection. And the question is not to target the good uh, workplaces, not to target the average ones, but to find what we call the dirty dozen. Yeah. And that is not very easy. Uh, but they are perhaps part of them, small enterprises who doesn't have the time or the resources to find out the information. They don't have time to read uh, good advice at, at uh, the social media. But the question is how to reach them. Because at the end, if you want to improve working conditions, it has to happen at the workplace. And if there is no interest at the workplace, it doesn't really happen, it doesn't really help to bring water to the well, it doesn't stay there. Okay. Who is working at the labor inspection? Can you please raise your hand? Up there, up there, yeah, just checking for a moment. Hello. Hello. You were the first one. Hi. Hi. Where are you from? Latvia. Latvia. Um, do you recognize this important role for labor inspection? Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. yeah because uh, it's also in Latvia that, that there's kind of scissors between good and the bad companies. The good companies are becoming better and better, and the worse ones are either the same or becoming worse and worse. Yeah. But that's of course a problem because we have Mr. Santos, and he's from a good company. So he's all the time, everywhere, saying we're doing a very good job. But we, we need the bad Santos. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, this is uh, what we try to do is that we are targeting uh, the bad companies with inspections, sending our inspectors to do the inspection part of the work. And then for the good companies, we are sharing good experiences and inviting those experts to share experience and to somehow in, uh, give this information, these ideas to the bad ones who might be interested to improve. But the worst thing is that they, in most cases, are even not interested in improving their conditions in their companies. But that's interesting because one of the things said this morning, or this afternoon, was also that it's, it's and, and, and Mr. Santos showed us, it, it improves your productivity. It, it helps the, 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 your company. So why don't they, these people understand this? I guess their business is based on totally different principles. Uh, they are not interested in the same people in growing com, uh, com, uh, productivity. They are. They say that, okay, if those people are not willing to work or they are not able to work because of the health status, then we will get some other people. So they, they, their business is not on the good grounds, but on very, very strange grounds. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Santos, do you know colleagues that are working this way? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to mention them, but do you, I, I'm trying to understand Adam, them. I learned my presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Repetitive, yeah. yeah. No, but, but to, to be honest, yeah. can, can you help us to understand why people don't want to have a, a, a healthy workplace? Why people don't want to have? Yeah, as a, as a company owner. No, 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 no. I, I think it's, it's not true because uh, I mean, the first, uh, the the only way to implement healthy workplaces is that the CEO and the comics are confines of it. Is the only way. Yeah. It's only top down, not okay. not down top. So the first thing you have to do is uh, talk with the CEO, to talk with the direction of the company, and convince them. Because at the end, it's a benefit for the enterprise. People, yeah. happy, uh, happy workers, or uh, with a healthy workplace with a good uh, ambience it works better yeah. than the, the other one. So, But you have to start at the top. Yeah. You have to explain them, convince yeah, them. You have to. Otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Is it sure. also your experience? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. It, it, you, have to, uh, you have to convince the CEO to, uh, uh, in order to get it onto, into the company. Okay. Yes. Without that it's, uh, it's impossible. Yeah, I understand because when we are sitting here and we think how can we improve working conditions, we have in mind a fairly good enterprise, 50, 100 people with a CEO. We don't think about the small enterprise yeah. with five people that are struggling to make ends meet, that are fighting to be able to pay the salaries at the end of the month. Yeah. who don't have the resources to go and look for uh, information on why is it good business to have good working conditions. And there are some of them that think that, oh, these government inspectors, I hope that yeah. they never come to our place. Yeah. So what we are looking at is how can we reach out to these and can we go through their accountancy companies, somebody that they trust and tell them that, look, if this worker who is working with your new machine gets sick for two weeks, how much will it cost you? Mm -hmm. Then they start to understand it. The other problem is that uh, on the statistics, an accident at a small enterprise happens once in seven years. And some of the small enterprises, they don't live that long. No. So wish and hope that it doesn't have for, have, uh, for us. But if I understood you right, then you also say you don't, you must be aware that you don't scare them off. You have to try to, to step in their shoes and understand what's worked, what works, uh, what their situation is, and then try to convince them. That's the difficult thing. Okay. 
Let, let's try to find out with the next panel how, what's maybe the best approach on that side. May I have a very warm applause, ladies and gentlemen, for these three panelists. <laughs> Mr. Van Leeuwen, Mr. Husberg and Mr. Santos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask to come to the floor, um, Mr. Alvarez Hidalgo, Mrs. Schaapman, and Mrs. Rebecca Smith. And you all get a warm applause when you come to the front. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Alvarez, Policy Officer at the Health and Safety Unit, the DG of Social Affairs Inclusion at the European Commission. Mrs. Schaapman, we already said, saw you before. Wonderful you're here, back again. And Mrs. Rebecca Smith, Senior Advisor, Business Europe. Please take a seat. Please take a seat. Or you may stand if you like, if it's more. Yeah. Mr. Smith, what do you think of this, this, this more, let's say, understanding approach of companies that was mentioned just before? Well, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's true that, of course, you need to approach companies in different ways. It depends on the company, on the size, on the sector and everything. But I don't think it's as simple as saying that there are good and bad companies. This, this, is, this is really a generalisation. And, and one issue I have in terms of labour inspection is... A lot of what we're discussing is how do we punish the bad companies mm -hmm. and we should be focusing much more in labour inspection on how do we help them understand as was said before why it makes good business sense to to come forward with health and safety actions policies etc so yeah. of course you need to take action when companies are, are operating illegally um, when they're not you know complying with the laws but you need to also find ways to help them and encourage them. So yeah. we would really hope that labour inspection moves a bit more in that direction. Yeah. Do, do you think that's already much uh, enough, um, uh, let's say, integrated in the, in the current policy, this approach? So a really sort of tailor-made approach for companies, uh, uh, not so talking about bad or good companies? No, I don't think it's integrated enough yet. I mean, when we hear from our, our national member federations, because of course we're, as an organisation we have national member federations, but when we hear from individual companies as well, we hear that, you know, they do need help, they do need assistance, particularly the smaller companies, but it, it's not just about helping the smaller companies, I think it's about also communicating more about why it makes good business sense, OSH policy, and, and what the benefits of it can be, and of course that also relates to the topic that we're discussing here today on, on healthy and active ageing. And I think a key issue for the companies is we often talk about this cliff edge scenario um, as employers. Um, this, uh, this, this is a problem in some sectors, in some companies more than others, but it's really a good way to communicate with the companies to tell them, look, look at the composition of your workforce, look what issues there are there, not only in terms of health and mm -hmm. safety, but in terms of skills, competence, and maybe in five or ten years you'll realise that actually you don't have the right composition or skills, competences in your workforce to move forward um, and you come to a cliff edge and this is not good for productivity and it's not good for the sustainability, mm -hmm. the economic sustainability of the, of the company. So that's really a good message to send, yeah. I think, to companies. But at the same time, as was mentioned, some companies don't care less. They, they think it's, we're just here for a short time or we just find new employees, so whatever. So they don't have the idea of this long-term sustainable approach. There'll always be bad companies out there, but there'll always be people that don't, aren't committed to the issue either. Okay. So let's not, let's not always be negative about the companies. It needs, it requires motivation from everybody. Not all employees are good employees either. So let's, yeah. let's make sure that we motivate everybody in this area and let's not just bash the companies. Okay. Mrs. Schaapman, what is the best way to motivate companies? I thought I'm going to ask you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I first take the liberty to react on... Uh, yeah, the, the, the after, uh, afterwards yeah. you may react. But ah, first, what's the best, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So okay. what's the best way to motivate companies? Well, I think uh, this, of course, depends on um, what kind of company you have in front of you. I think you need a differentiated approach. Hmm. Because, uh, as, uh, as Rebecca says, uh, well, I agree with her, um, that it is really a good, uh, good thing to help companies uh, uh, to get better, to give them uh, uh, 
means and, and, and to, to, to train them and to, 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 to have uh, uh, advisory uh, companies that help them, mm -hmm. etc. This is really good. Um, but then, as you say, uh, there's also uh, always uh, the bad side and uh, we need to do something about that also. Uh, what, what I really like, uh, I'm still going to That's react, okay. no, I'm sorry. Uh, well, because I liked uh, what you said. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, because what, uh, what you did by, uh, by mentioning this, uh, this approach is taking the problem away from the individual company and from the individual worker. There, um, because if we, um, I mean, I am very much in favor of awareness campaigns. I'm very much in favor of uh, sharing good practices. But what we also need is a structural approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, helping companies is a kind of a structural approach. Yeah. The other side of a structural approach is that we give workers better position to to fight for their own health and safety. Mm -hmm. Because if you are in a company that doesn't care about your health and safety and you know you, you, you fall ill uh, and uh, 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 there's other workers waiting for you to take your place, um, what can you do as a worker? So we need to give workers better rights. And this is, this is very structural because this, is, this has also to do with temporary work, flexible contracts, uh, and but also with the uh, the right of workers to okay. to to proceed uh, to to go to court. Well, this is the the final okay. solution. Yeah. But Mr. Alvarez, if I am an employee, where do I find support at the European Union level? Well, in the, in different ways. Uh, you know, the European Commission is very is very active in promoting policy principles. But the real challenge is to, to make uh, applicable and to, to apply in practice these, these principles. And first, uh, I see here in our discussions that the issue of aging at the workplace now is very high in the political agenda, mm -hmm. uh, both at EU level and at national level. Several years ago, it was not the same. No. So uh, maybe the first step is, uh, is awareness is to make aware the society, not only employers are workers, uh, all the actors in the, in the working life of the need of tackling this kind of, of issues. So, uh, you know, in, in policy initiatives, everything is related. Uh, of course, for instance, in practical terms, this agency, the European Agency, the Bilbao Agency, is making a, a great job in, in disseminating uh, not only awareness, but mm -hmm. also practical tools. And that's, in my view, one of the most, uh, let's say, visible uh, and practical elements that employers can, uh, can have. But uh, this is only one part of the overall picture, because there are many other things being done uh, right now in order to make it uh, more uh, fair and better functioning labor markets. And this is related not only strictly with health and safety at work. It's related, for instance, with uh, good working conditions in general. It's related with our work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I think we, we all are more and more sensitized to this need of balance. Mm -hmm. And that's why... Active the, aging as well? Active aging, de definitely. Uh, definitely, active aging is part of this overall picture. Mm -hmm. And the, the Commission actually promoted and launched this uh, European pillar of social rights. Uh, probably you have seen in the news uh, a few days ago, a few days ago, in, last Friday, it was this social summit yeah. in Gothenburg, in, in Sweden, in which not only the Commission, but also the European Parliament and the Council uh, jointly proclaimed this European uh, pillar of social rights, mm -hmm. encompassing a lot of different elements. Uh, and all of them um, uh, po <coughs> sorry, pointing at achieving uh, not only more fair and more sustainable working, uh, uh, working conditions, but uh, in general uh, better conditions. Okay. And the key idea of the, uh, that Europe is taking care of people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we have survived a very critical uh, moments in the economic crisis a few years ago. Vale, vale. Now, Europe is, is recovering, is in the, in the way of recovery. 
but many people has this impression that Europe uh, is taking uh, care only of, of the economy, mm -hmm. of companies, of business and so on. And this is not the case. Europe is taking care also of people. Okay. Uh, and that's uh, for us a critical issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, because um, we were talking quite a lot about awareness all the time. What, what's the next step after awareness? So what's, how, make, how do we make it a little bit more harsh, more practical, more that you can really sort of, if, if I'm an employee, that I really have the feeling that I have my own rights and I can start the discussion about my workplace? Well, I think you're right. Awareness is, is the first step. Well, it's one of the steps, let's say, communication, um, but then also looking at practical tools. And I think, uh, you know, we talk a lot about policy and policy is all well and good, but policy doesn't mean practice. Policy is only as good no. as, as the implementation. So, I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of this kind of campaign of the, of the agency. It's about exchanging, giving access uh, for employers and employees to, to tools. Um, to look at their risk assessment procedures, but also to, to look at how to, a bit like I said before, how do you assess the profile of your company? How do you work out where the gaps are, where the problem areas are, where the opportunities are? And I mean, there are lots of different tools you can do this. Our, this the one that's already been mentioned that, of course, I take the opportunity to mention here is the framework agreement of the European yeah. Social Partners uh, on Active Aging as well. Oh, March, last March? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, just checking. Uh, Iris, you're checking if there are any questions. Yeah, are there any questions? Yeah, just show me. Let's see if we can... Because else people thinking we're all putting things on Slido and they're not using it. A sort of cliffhanger. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, they're picking questions. Yeah. <laughs> How many questions are there? Ah, here it is. Anonymous. Where should we be heading? Should we be adapting jobs according to the age of job holder or rather designing jobs with diverse workforce in mind? It's anonymous, but whose question it is? <laughs> Please, oh, it would be nice if you can say, tell me who's, who sent this question. No? Oh, don't dare. Sitting next to someone, you can point at him or her, I won't come to you. No? Okay. Now, just may I ask you to react on this one? May I ask you to react on this question? You can see it also over here. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I think I got it. Both. Hmm? Both. Both? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I think it's good to design jobs with with in your mind uh, 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 a diverse uh, workforce uh, as respect age um, but at the same time in practice you don't always have the choice to 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 make your workforce diverse i mean uh, as a as an employer you are sometimes it's a bit negative to say but stuck with a workforce and uh, uh, which is is growing older and then all of a sudden you think oh, I would need some age diversity mm -hmm. but this is not done overnight no. so uh, uh, and here comes the, the structural thing also uh, uh, in, in, in the play again because if you want to make your workforce more diverse you need means also to do so you cannot just uh, hire extra young people so uh, uh, for example if you have a worker that has fallen ill or is weak mm -hmm. or you know can only work half time then uh, you want to hire maybe a younger person beside her to 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 help and to yeah. to well how do you do it as an employer i mean it's maybe something rebecca also can uh, reflect on because uh, it's I, I mean it's it's also uh, a matter of um, um, uh, money and keeping yeah. people employed I, I did so once. I had a, I had a weaker worker and I, I, I had a, a younger worker beside her, which is fantastic. Yeah, also more expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the employer needs to make that choice. Okay, I, I, I spent some money to make this possible. Yeah. 
This is, of course, all the time quite difficult, uh, Mr. Smith, that um, when we're talking about policy, most of you, uh, who of you has, a, has his or her own business, officially? Well, please, I'm not coming up to you. I'm, not, I'm just staying here. Yeah, I just want to know, yeah. Because this is that one of the things that we're talking about policy and, and implementation and what people need to do, but um, at the same time, they're, they're not uh, uh, dependent on their, for their income of, of their company. Is that one of the problems also when you talk about this issue? I'm not sure it's a problem, it's an issue. I mean, yeah. of course, adapting workplaces, changing, I don't know, the, the equipment at worst, that costs money for, for, for companies. Of course, you can, you can do a kind of cost-benefit calculation to see, okay, if I make these changes, then will it improve the possibilities for that worker to stay? But I think this idea of should we be adapting jobs according to the age of the job holder it's, I don't know who asked the question, but it, it's rather yeah. narrow, the focus. I mean, we should be looking at the capabilities of workers and making sure that they're in the right jobs. Yeah. Of course, there are limits to that because there are certain jobs in companies that you can't change. There are in certain companies and all companies. There are certain jobs that have to be done. You can only adapt them to a certain extent. But, but let's not forget somebody who is... Um, one person who is 60, 65, 67, and another person of the same age, they don't have the same capabilities. They don't have the same issues necessarily. And this idea that at a certain age we need to change everything, I don't think that's the right approach. And I also find it a bit, it's almost a kind of discrimination. We say, okay, people reach a certain age and we have to change. I, if I was a certain age and people said, no, now you have to do things differently because you know you're getting a bit old. I don't know. I, I take a bit of an offence to that. Uh, I don't think I it's a great way of doing things. That's why you... Do you agree on this? Certainly. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I agree. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. I agree. Um, I have the impression that beyond the, let's say, the philosophical reflections, uh, there are the, the practical challenges. Uh, and you very clearly explained, uh, Rebecca, this, this practical challenge in the day-by-day -day, uh, life of the companies. I was remembering when reading this question and when uh, hearing to you, uh, you remember five, six years ago, uh, especially in the, in the governing board of the agency, when we started preparing this, this campaign that is closing now on, on uh, healthy workplaces for all ages, at the beginning, uh, the approach was more, let's say, protecting uh, older workers. You remember this ambitious project? But uh, with the time, and after a lot of discussions in this tripartite environment, governments, workers, employers, and, and the commission, uh, we started to have a more global view of uh, ensuring the challenge, the real challenge of ensuring uh, healthy workplaces for everybody, uh, regardless of the, of the age, starting by young workers, because they are part of the, of the picture. Young workers are the, are the future. So, uh, and this uh, opens up a lot this broader perspective of taking care of combining all these elements in order to have uh, inclusive and uh, well-adapted workplaces. Of course, in the day-by-day -day life, uh, it's not easy to, to adapt and to implement these principles. Okay. But I think more and more uh, employers and more and more workers organizations are now aware of the need of tackling these, these elements. Ms. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would um, uh, like to add uh, a more structural approach also because um, um, we, we mentioned in the beginning, um, all of us mentioned uh, the advantages of getting old but also the disadvantages of getting older and we all agree that this has to do with physical uh, uh, functioning. Mm -hmm. And um, getting tired a little bit earlier and, uh, and not being so strong anymore, etc. And um, so we need, I mean, I totally agree that uh, we do not have to discriminate because somebody is older, but we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, we get older and uh, some jobs are physically or mentally very demanding. And then one of the structural solutions, and I thought maybe I, I would hear it from the good practices uh, examples, but um, I'm going to bring it in myself, is I think the generation pact. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, this is, uh, I think, a, a solution which is very human. 
Um, and this is uh, uh, by way of uh, reducing uh, the working time of uh, the elderly, uh, give some more working time to the younger, and create some financial compensation for the elder that go work less. This is also, for example, possible for night work. Mm -hmm. It's after a certain age, it becomes more and more unhealthy to work at night. We all know that. The risk of bre breast cancer is only one risk yeah. uh, to mention. So after the age of, I don't know exactly, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but 50 or 55, we should stop night work completely. And this we can also do by way of a generation pact. Yeah. Thank you. And so, Vance, I was wondering, because the remark of the professor was also that we have to look at the, the education level and the impact of that. And of course, we're sort of at, at the end of this campaign at this moment, but this, maybe this one was underestimated. This one should have been much more important in the whole campaign. Probably it has been underestimated, not in this campaign, but in general in policy terms. This need uh, of uh, not only tackling inequalities, as, as uh, Maria very in a very brilliant way explained, um, but also in the, in the direct uh, context of, of companies. So I personally uh, like so much this approach of Generation Pact. And I, I think this is very well enshrined in the, let's say, in the European values. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe is about uh, solidarity. It's about uh, stronger, uh, together we are stronger. Eh? And this concept of pact uh, between generations, I think, is a um, pragmatic way of tackling these, these practical elements that you, you, you explain very, very well. For instance, the night work uh, issue. So, um, Maybe an educational pact. Educational. Um, <laughs> I was discussing briefly with, with Maria after uh, her presentation about critical factors. And it's obvious that mm -hmm. the skills and the, and the educational factors uh, are critical issues. Yeah. Uh, and they, uh, as he explained, uh, these kind of factors make the difference mm -hmm. in, in how people, in how workers are, uh, are positioned, yeah. uh, especially in the, in the older ages. And there is one element, not only in the educational aspect, but in general, in, in the overall context of health inequalities, is the element of uh, instability. Uh, the more inequalities we have, the less stable is our society. <laughs> and I think that's, uh, that's a, a critical point also okay. to, be, to be tackled. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, you're picking another question. They need to be processed again. Yeah. yeah. Will social partners become obsolete in the platform economy? Uber. Ah. No, it's a personal question of Jan Michiel Meusen. Where is Jan Michiel Meusen? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, over there. Where, where is Jan Michiel? Oh, uh, uh, over there. Hi. Why, why do you connect this to the, this discussion? Because. Yeah. May I ask you to stand up for a moment? Yeah. Oh, be careful. Thank you. Um, I ask this question because there are social partners here, yeah. three, and they are talking about workers and managers and this and structures. And we, this morning we had an excellent presentation on the, the platform economy or crowd work, sometimes they call it. And uh, yeah, my question to the social partners is what, what will be your role there? Uh, I mean, maybe this is a bit of a negative question, uh, yeah. but how will you try to influence uh, this type of work? Yeah. And also, uh, keeping in mind, so the, the healthy workplace, for example, you can start such a discussion, but if you have a platform like Uber, you don't know even where you, who you're talking to at the moment. No, those workplaces are constantly moving, especially Uber. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some, some dramatic examples of uh, a professor who was presenting a research on the, in that area that those workers, yeah, those are individual persons, they sleep in their car for 10 hours, they have constipation yeah, because you are sitting all the time. So, uh, yeah, just my question, what will be the role of social partners? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Mr. Schapman, may I start with you? So maybe this is a, a, a discussion of yesterday, the discussion of tomorrow, 
we, we, we don't know who we talk to. Yes, thank you very much for, for this question because, uh, well, I don't know exactly what it has to do with active aging, but I don't mind. I mean, no, it uh, has to do with the quality of your workplace. Yeah, and, absolutely. And the discussions absolutely. Like we have yeah. now for yeah. aging yeah. or a healthy yeah. workplace. Yeah. There is no counterpart in the No, I, I don't mind whether it has to do with active aging. Yeah, or I because do. It, it, okay, okay, you too. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I think this is a very important question and a very uh, puzzling question, and it is really a challenge for unions and I also employers' organization uh, to to tackle it. Uh, I'm not an expert in the topic, but I am warm-heartedly supporting union renewal in this respect. So yeah. we think about this, we have, we, we, we... But not only union renewal, but maybe social partners. Yes. So the discussions you have together, say what sort of discussion do we need to have together, knowing on one side that we still want to improve workplace, that we still want to have active aging, for example, and on the other side knowing that the economy is changing. Yeah, so find new forms of organization also, I think. Yeah, yeah I mean, we already at a European level, we, we discussed between social partners the broader issues of digitalization. I don't think social partners will become obsolete because of these developments. There's a lot of discussion around platform economy, um, new forms of working uh, nowadays, but when you actually look at the statistics, and we were talking about the importance of data before, it's still a tiny, tiny yeah. proportion compared to the other companies uh, around. So let's not get too concerned or worried about this. Yeah. And anyway, from the point of view of employers, these kinds of, these different types of working, we shouldn't assume that the working conditions are negative. We shouldn't assume that they're having a negative impact on, on health and safety. People choose these kinds of working for different reasons, whether it's to have Objection. more autonomy, whether it's to have... Yeah, go on, yeah. People choose these kind of uh, forms of working, okay? We're having a discussion now about whether people choose them or they're forced exactly. into them, yeah. fine. But a lot of people choose these forms of working because they want to work in a different way, because they don't necessarily want to be represented by a bigger body, because they want more autonomy, because they, they want to have more autonomy over their working time. Um, and I think it's, you know, of course we have to look at if there are gaps in terms of access to social protection. That's another big discussion we're having yeah. at a European level. But let's not overplay the development. These developments are going on. We're not going to stop them. We have to see how we can accompany them. And one of the issues we have is that there's this assumption that new forms of working are bad and that we should all be in permanent kind of mm -hmm. nine to five jobs. And I think we have to move away from that assumption because this is the way the world is moving and it's about accompanying that change, not standing in the way of it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just thinking, are there any other questions that are not on Slido, but they're still in your head? No. Just checking, are there a lot of questions over there? Because nobody is nodding when I ask if there's any question. No. Just take one other question. Maybe also a question, one of the nine questions before, of the, for the, the after presentation of the Professor Albin. <coughs> yeah, here. Do we need to redefine how intensive and how long we work to be able to last at work till 65? Hmm. Do we need to redefine how intensive and how long we work? Who agrees on this one? Can you please raise your hand? You say, I agree on this one. We need to redefine. I'm, I'm staying here. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah? We say, no, we don't need to redefine. What we're doing now is uh, it's okay. We leave it like this. One. Okay. What do you think? Redefine? Thank you. Um, that's tricky. That's a tricky question. I think, obviously, it depends on, on many factors. It depends on the specific uh, jobs. It's not the same working in mining or for sure. working as a yeah. teacher, for instance. So, um, redefine the concept for me is okay, but the practicalities on how to redefine that uh, are very depending on the yeah. sectors and on the, on the specific jobs. That's yeah. my, my way. And it's not always easy to arithmetically fix that uh, okay. compared with the 65 years for all, for instance. So 
I understand the approach, but in my way, in my view, is very generic. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Alban, may I ask you, what do you think of this? May I ask you to stand up for a moment, as we can see you. Yeah. Yes, I think there is definitely uh, a need to look into this. For instance, we need know that long working hours without uh, enough, enough time to recover after that increases the risk for many chronic diseases. Uh, and uh, we, need, we know that we need to keep the population as healthy as possible. It also seems that there is a, a cumulative uh, effect of uh, physical strain. So if we want to keep people able to work longer, we uh, probably have to look into this much more than we've done so far. And so that we maybe have a sort of tailor-made approach of, of the age of 65. Uh, for some jobs, as you were showing also on the graph, that for some people it's 65, a little bit lower, a little bit higher, also maybe based on, on, the, on the occupation itself. Yeah, I, I think that, that there is both the nature of the work and the demands of the work, but there is also the inequalities in health that we see in people who have different occupations. So if we reduce the social inequalities in work from different, through different measures, there will be less of a problem in the workplace. If the public health policies and other policies go the other way, there will more, be more problems in the workplace in order to keep people longer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, 5.30. Um, today it's uh, Tuesday. On Thursday, probably, so tomorrow you have another working day here in this building. On Thursday, you're back home. And people were saying, okay, so this first day, what, what, what happened on this first day? So you had a different, uh, all sort of presentations and remarks, and we had a, a panel discussion. Uh, okay, but what, what, what's still in your mind after this, this first day? Um, so my last remark, or my last question for you on this very healthy work spot we're here, is again, two minutes with your neighbor. What do you take home after this discussion? So someone will ask you on Thursday, what happened in this panel discussion? What do you remember? Your neighbor is still sitting next to you. So, two minutes, directly with your neighbor. And even if you have two neighbors, it's no problem. Same question for the panelist. Research shows that you always remember just one thing after today. That's always the same. You only remember one thing. Um, let, let, let's find out. May I ask you, what do you remember after today? May I ask you to stand up for a moment? Uh, too much. <laughs> too much. Just one thing. So I, I run into you. Yes, it is my experience that uh, aging and active aging is always more and more important for Europe and uh, the rest of the world. And I have learned a lot because uh, the stakeholders are here and it's very important that the, not only the social partners but the wider range of the stakeholders are present here. It's wonderful and I am an HR and PR expert and uh, I represent all the Women Network Europe. It's a European organization and uh, I am also delegated by HBET from Europe. I have to write a detailed report and I have a lot to 
uh, to get back. And uh, I would also like to emphasize that uh, cooperation between generations in the workplace is very important because sometimes the older employees are important, but the young ones are, you know, not always like. In one minute, when you were thinking for one minute, this was all okay, wonderful. Yeah, let me ask you. Yeah. Sure. sure. Well, what I do remember is that um, for me, one of the most important questions was not asked. Ah, and that was? And that was um, to ask people um, why they did stay for very long, mm. for very long years. And when you do that, what people mostly answer is not so much about the about the direct, what we discussed here in working circumstances. It's a lot about they feel appreciated, if they feel a purpose, and if they feel a sense of belonging. And these are cultural factors that we know from, 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 from many years, we do know that they can even um, compensate other factors. I'm not saying that they're not important, but we need to focus a lot more these factors, what really makes people want and get the most out of their job, and this is meaning, purpose, and, um, and appreciation. And I, see, I think also involvement. As I was discussing a little bit with Mr. Santos, the, the involvement is in, uh, uh, with, with your own work. And this, the sense of belonging, which is one of the most powerful, it's glue and lubricant both for, among people. Yeah. Thanks very much. Can I ask over here? Yeah. They applaud before you start talking. This is wonderful. Yeah, I don't know who you are, but it's very. No, thank you very much. Yeah. I think you need something limited. So uh, from today, I will remember that we have problems, we have good practices, and as social partners, we have the willingness to move on. That's it for today. Thank you. Someone else? No. Look at front. Yeah, Mr. Van Leeuwen. What do you remember after today? <laughs> um, well, I have one, one uh, remark because everybody was asked but, like, what pros and cons for aging, yeah. but well, not me, so I'd like to say something. Okay. Uh, this is more personal, biographic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're doing a research right now in the Netherlands on personality and sustainable employability and the, the correlation between those two. And there is a, there is a correlation between uh, some traits like uh, cons consciousness and uh, per, uh, perseverance and it happens to be that those traits grow with age so that's a very positive message for those who are aging you know. thank you very much dear panelists have you been talking to each other in those two minutes yeah they come up with a, a social partner advice one big social partner advice this is the moment yeah so who is the spokesperson yeah, this is Japan. Yeah, yeah, you're 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 the spokesperson of the show. Yeah, okay. So now this is very difficult because they are looking at you. You have to say the one thing that they agree on. Yes, I think I can, and I, I I'm not going to let this chance pass. So um, uh, what I heard uh, was no, what uh, we what we what we heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. What? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Welcome. I can be short. Let's get into action and let's do it together. And I think what we heard today was a basis for that. I mean, I hear the employers say workplace needs to be central in our approach. I hear um, you say also uh, uh, the social pillar of rights is very much in the center of, uh, of Europe. And, uh, but my, my core message is action at shop floor level. Workers should be protected and uh, get an, a healthy career. Just checking. <laughs> and I would like to add that we as a social partner. I would like to add that we as a social partner. <laughs> um, commitment, that's my word for today. It's not only the job of the employers. It's not only the job of the government, it's also the job of the workers and the co-workers to also take action in terms of their own health inside and outside the workplace. Because that also, that we haven't touched on today so much, and that's what I would have said also in relation to healthy life expectancy, 
this also has a lot to do with lifestyle, okay. not just the workplace. It's also outside the workplace, and it's a yeah. public health issue as well. Yeah. So far, I agree. Or would you like to add, as we as social partners? I fully agree with my definition the Commission has to respect the <laughs> autonomy of social partners. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, I, I agree. And I retain that uh, we have heard a lot of useful experiences. The Dutch initiative on sustainable employability, the, the Finnish national program on aging workers, the PSA specific initiatives. And I, I retain that it's not only uh, possible, it's necessary to tackle jointly these, these aspects. And I think we, with this kind of reflections, we are in the, in the right way yeah. to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have a very warm applause. Ms. Alvarez, Ms. Schabner, Ms. Smith, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.